Welcome everyone. My name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix, and you are here for the 21st anniversary 35 millimeter screening of Beavis and Butthead Do America. Yeah. Let's give it up. Now, um, I've been doing a film series for 15 years uh, here in San Francisco. It's called Midnights for Maniacs, and it started out at the Four Star Theater out in the Richmond. Um, and it's been celebrating underrated and overlooked films. Uh, the goal of this series, it started right around the same time that Peaches Christ started uh, her Midnight Mass at the bridge. And um, originally it was at midnight. Uh, people would come out and uh, I found that the midnight audience that I grew up with often would come out to get drunk and stoned and there wasn't anywhere else for them to go. And um, they would watch a certain type of movie at midnight. And uh, I found that a lot of those movies, they were actually really good. Um, they weren't just films that the studios didn't want to distribute or play during the regular times. Uh, that they were actually really smart. And smarter than maybe even some of the audience members at midnight realized, because they were so fucked up that they, they weren't really digesting them. And so Midnight's for Maniacs has um, surprised me here in the Bay Area, because it's been a, a terrible time for movie theaters. Um, I'm sure that many of you who've lived here have watched them fall like flies. Uh, and it's so special to have the series here at the oldest movie theater in San Francisco. Can you give it up for the Roxy Theater? Um, I stress this every time that I, I do an event here, um, because it's hard. It's hard to come out. Probably some of you have already worked. You've got a babysitter. Um, hopefully you brought your kid <laughs> to come and see uh, what I feel is a, a genuine masterpiece. Um, Beavis and Butthead Do America was um, on the tail end of the TV show, and uh, I happen to be in college. I don't know where you came into uh, Beavis and Butthead, the TV show, uh, but like a lot of satire or parodies, uh, critics, they, they, don't, they don't seem to understand it. Uh, they see the surface, and uh, clearly these guys are stupid, and so then the uh, animation is not very well drawn, and uh, there's just this A-list category that the film is purposely not fitting into, and um, I was really intrigued by um, when I would meet someone that would say, I really love Beavis by it. <laughs> now, a lot of the movies that Midnight says for Maniacs has screened, I've found people they call them their guilty pleasures. Um, and uh, I really don't believe in guilty pleasures. Um, I think that that's a cop-out. Uh, that's, that's you saying that you have some amazing highbrow taste and you'll lower your standards for just tonight because you don't know why, but for some reason, Mike Judge is really smart, you could say that. And that he created these two very surreal characters um, as you will get to experience on the big screen tonight, that um, actually have maybe something accidentally to say, uh, but that doesn't mean Mike Judge didn't have a whole lot to say. He just sort of removed uh, the intelligence uh, from our main characters. And in old film history, we would call them anti-heroes. Then I gotta tell you what they're supposed to be doing. You have to figure it out for yourself. Now, I don't need you to think this movie is a masterpiece. Uh, it could be just a good time. But I do think that there is something uh, its just underneath the surface here, and I want to throw out the idea that these characters are unentitled. And uh, to be unentitled in America uh, changes your entire perspective, uh, not just in how you go about your life, but how people treat you. And um, maybe some of you, you grew up with the next TV show that Mike Judge made, what was that? King of the Hill. King of the Hill. And uh, I know that a lot of you, you have uh, some very strong feelings about a couple of movies that uh, Mike Judge has made, specifically... Idiocracy. And Office Space. Okay, Office Space and Idiocracy, right? Um, and um, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to say anything. I just want us to actually watch this movie 21 years later. This is a 35 millimeter print. Uh, I can tell you that the studio was um, surprised that anyone would want to play this. <laughs> Uh, and what that means is that we're actually getting uh, something very special. Um, to me, watching something on film um, is a, a strong point for the film series. 
Uh, this is how it screened originally. You'll even get to see some scratches on it. Um, and we have a projectionist who is up in the booth. His name is Carl. Let's give it up for Carl. Uh, and we've got two projectors. It's one of the last remaining theaters in the city that projects 35 millimeter. Um, he's up there. He will transition from one projector to the other. Some of you, you, you know about this, but there's this right-hand corner signifier that after every reel, uh, what do we see up there? Cigarette burn. It's a cigarette burn. And uh, that's to let the projectionist know that he's hand transitioning it. And I know that you've had enough experiences um, at the studio, uh, mall theaters, that uh, the film is just out of, it's just blurry, it's just out of frame. Uh, the amount of 3D movies that aren't in 3D and I have to wander down the hallways to find someone. Uh, there is absolutely no personal connection and it's what's so special about you coming out tonight uh, to see a movie that I have a feeling some of you have seen a lot. Uh, I always like to ask this. First off, who's never seen Beavis and Butthead do America? Proudly raise it up. Let's look around at this. Wonderful. Now I teach film history at the Academy of Art and, and there, I have students who are 21 years old. So, the year this movie came out, they were born. So you can't ever expect anyone to um, have a reference point. Uh, this, is, this is their first time to get to see it. I'm so envious. Now, some of you have seen it a lot, and I'm curious, who thinks they've seen it the most? Like, who's a Beavis and Butthead Do America super fan? Right? Not just the TV show. But what are you talking here? How many views? That's what I'm asking. I've seen it seven times. Okay, seven times. That's pretty good, right? That's honest. I've seen it over 50 Okay, you need to come up here then. <laughs> no, no, no. I have a present for you. Please, trust me. Come here. Okay? Come here. It's a small present, but I have a feeling that you will appreciate it. Um, this is a cassette. <laughs> and this is uh, Slayer, Rain in Blood. <laughs> yeah. Super fan right there. You can sell that cassette, by the way, because cassettes are back. Those things go for like $25 a pop now, so if you have any in your basement, bring them to me. Um, and like all sort of nostalgia, uh, this, this is... This is definitely going to be therapy to be able to laugh in these days. Um, but more importantly, I really do want you to put an extra effort into uh, how smart this film is. Uh, and that the animation is um, it's not poorly drawn. It's actually uh, really clever. And uh, they really amped it up with this a little bit for the movies, uh, the theatrical release. And oddly enough, this movie became the highest grossing film in December in the history of cinema. <laughs> now, I know that uh, film critics and film reviewers at the time were definitely saying this is how, how low our society had dropped. Uh, but then two weeks later, a movie beat this film to become the highest grossing film in the history of December. 1997, as you might know. Scream. It's called Titanic. <laughs> right? So, so Beavis and Butthead do America and Titanic uh, are, are linked together forever. I think Scream is on the list. Though. That is, that's true. But tonight, instead of playing something, um, I love to play double bills. We used to show triple bills, in fact, uh, at the very beginning of Midnight's for Maniacs. But to try and combine two movies into one. This is a very short film, and I'm hoping that some of you, you'll just stick around. It's, it's a Thursday night. Uh, you definitely have nowhere else to go. <laughs> um, and uh, we have a 35 millimeter print of Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Yeah! And uh, if there was ever a movie to watch right now, I would say that this is it. And um, the, the concept of putting two films together that don't necessarily match, right? We could have played the South Park movie, or we could have played uh, Idiocracy, which would be fun. Uh, there's an experiment that's happening when you show these two films, and I can honestly tell you I've had some programmers contact me from L.A. and from Chicago. Beavis and Butthead Do America and Natural Born Killers have never played together in the history of cinema. No theater has ever played these two movies. So I really would stress to you to try and uh, stick through this. 
Uh, lastly, you've got a ticket stub that um, I make. I would love for you to pull this thing out. Uh, you've got a raffle number that's up in the right-hand corner uh, in tribute to perhaps our uh, cigarette burn. And uh, I like to keep my ticket stubs. It's one way that you can remember it. Maybe you'll meet your new best friend here in the theater. I can tell you that you make sure to turn your cell phone off during the movie, then I will be your best friend. Um, but I would love to give a free large popcorn to number 48. Who's number 48? Hold, you guys, look at who just won. Raise your hands. Number 48, Beavis and Butthead, Do America's Superfan. That was not planned. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I will give, do you want butter on it? Do you want butter? No, sir. All right. Um, so uh, the theater is a nonprofit theater, so every time you come out here, you're completely supporting us. We really appreciate it. Um, I put a couple of trailers here before the movie to get you in the mood. You saw Taxi Driver and Bringing Out the Dead. That is Midnight's for Maniacs next event in August. Well, Taxi Driver is a celebrated classic. Uh, Bringing Out the Dead is the unofficial sequel that Mark Scorsese and Paul Schrader wrote together. And Nicolas Cage's performance is, is just unbelievable in it, uh, as is Tom Sizemore. Uh, it's really about you trying, trying out perhaps a film that you, um, you love like Beavis and Butthead, and then maybe sticking around for the second film. Um, trailers before this, uh, hopefully will make you bridge together this idea of a road trip across America. And um, you guys, thanks so much. My name is Jesse Alton Fix. This is Midnight's for Maniacs. Ice that people breaks the casino, you know what I mean? It's been nice, ain't it? I know. Ain't nobody ever gonna take the time. Ain't nobody ever gonna take the time. Can we give it up for Beavis and Butthead? Do America? Now briefly, we have, uh, I've got more giveaways, uh, quite an amazing uh, poster in fact, so those of you who don't think that you're going to stick around for the entire movie, there's at least some trailers and another raffle, so just hang tight for 10 minutes, we'll start up at 9.05, and uh, I highly recommend you sticking around for Natural Born Killers, thanks you guys. All right, welcome back, and for those of you who are just arriving, can we give it up for Beavis and Butthead Do America again? Uh, that, that, that film has not played in 21 years in a theater here in San Francisco. Um, and um, there's, I want to be serious about the film while it really is enjoyable and, and perhaps quite nostalgic. Uh, there was an animator, Ralph Bakshi, who would take his animation quite seriously and try and confront serious issues. It was not made for children. He made rated X films, in fact. And uh, someone like Mike Judge, you know, he grew up with this, and then at the same time he's translating it into his, sort of his own time period. But I can't help but recognize that Beavis and Butthead have the same sort of comic timing and um, accidental genius that Charlie Chaplin had. Or um, there's a Yasujiro Ozu film about two little kids who all they want is a television set. And uh, these are movies that are celebrated in the film history textbooks, and I understand that Beavis and Butthead Do America uh, has not been uh, recognized in that sense, but it really is up to you as a viewer. You don't have to listen to somebody else. You don't have to uh, go along with liking this movie. But uh, going out of your way to think about it uh, is something that I know I read, I, I don't just read uh, The New Yorker, and I also don't just read Film Comment. Is, uh, I look out to a lot of you who write your own blogs, or write your own essays, uh, even those of you that post online. And um, I think that it's a, it's a cycle here of film history. And um, the 
I've said it before, but the screwball comedies of the 1930s, uh, they were not celebrated at the time. And it took young filmmakers, or soon-to-be filmmakers, to write about those films 10 to 20 years later. And uh, Beavis and Butthead is one of those screwball comedies, right? It's so ridiculous that it actually might make sense. Um, what we're walking into with Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers is just literally uh, perhaps the most experimentally made mainstream film. Uh, he reached out with his cinematographer. Oh, Robert Richardson? Robert Richardson. Um, that he's going above and beyond to try and use every single camera or technique or editing or uh, this movie has more energy in just this two hours than sincerely an entire decade's worth of studios films. Um, Oliver Stone went on to make another film after this called Nixon that is also uh, truly inspired and uh, you will have so much food for thought that I, I really need us to start this film now because uh, it's a Thursday night. Um, this is not the director's cut which has a couple of extra minutes of violence um, because uh, that is not available in 35 millimeter. And uh, it's something that this film series, Midnight's for Maniacs, has stressed, uh, is that you're getting to see something that's tangible, that has been around now for uh, close to 23 years. Um, and we have a projectionist who has a job because of this 35 millimeter. Um, and that's a very rare thing nowadays. Uh, this is a skill that people not only trained for, but unionized with, and uh, then now we, we don't even have monkeys in a projection booth anymore. It's all time. There's no personal skill put into it, so I'd love for you to give it up to Carl here tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a genuine, thankless job, because we only uh, notice the projection when something goes wrong and we expect it to go perfect, and uh, that's not the way that the world works. And in fact, this print, uh, he specced it and wanted to give us all a little heads up. There's some, some really interesting um, flaws uh, that aren't major at all, but you'll notice it on some of our uh, cigarette burn chain, real changes that uh, over time, each theater that plays these prints, uh, they do stuff to it. And uh, we're going to get, it will only enhance the experimental experience here uh, with Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Now, um, this idea of satire and parody. Uh, Natural Born Killers was quite offensive and controversial when it came out. Uh, I happened to get to see it as a child, a uh, young kid when it came out. And it was um, very overwhelming in a Utah movie theater. Uh, many films were banned in Salt Lake City where I grew up, and they were unofficially banned. In fact, the, the theater owner he would just decide if he would play a movie. Um, and uh, the idea that satire and parody might actually be digging deeper as opposed to causing more problems to our society is sort of the theme for tonight. And um, there's a specific filmmaker who's been making movies this past 15 years that I feel like has been doing quite a good job at working within the genre making parodies of those genres, uh, and in fact then making a film that will withstand the test of time. And his name is Edgar Wright. I'd love for you to give it up if you like this guy. Um, and Jack, you can't answer this. Um, but I'm curious if anyone knows what his very first film was. He directed a feature-length film. And uh, what was his first movie? No, it's before Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead is the first studio film that he got released, uh, which was followed by Hot Fuzz and The World's End. Okay, let's pull out our ticket stubs. Let's do this raffle style. Are we ever gonna find that? You're gonna have to do some autodidactic research. <laughs> Uh, to find these things out because uh, young filmmakers who become famous, often their earliest work, you will find uh, some really special moments in them. So seeking that out, I know is more important than me telling it to you and then suddenly you're like, well, who fucking cares? <laughs> um, but seek it out. All right, so let's give this um, really special treat to uh, number 21.
is 21 here. You got to come down and get it. That's amazing. You're still here. This is beautiful. Are you an Edgar Wright fan? Well, what I'm going to give you here is a Blood and Ice Cream Trilogy alternative art poster that is signed and numbered by the artist of Spoke Art and Framed, just for you. Wow. Thank you. Give it up right here for Edgar Wright, number 21 fan. Now, as I mentioned, Taxi Driver and Bringing Out the Dead is the next double feature here with Midnight's for Maniacs, and we will, in fact, be having brand new posters made for Taxi Driver, uh, Spoke Art Gallery uh, here in San Francisco, hires new artists uh, to make these things, and hopefully it makes the screening memorable. Your ticket stub, you could actually save. Um, you're supporting the nonprofit Roxy Theater, which means a lot, and um, I want to mention that the last time that I played Natural Born Killers, uh, someone lost their mind. Um, he, he literally just started screaming uh, consistently for about 30 seconds. Um, and I had to go over to him and sit next to him. Um, it, was, it was fascinating. Uh, and so I'm warning you, I think that the film definitely has more trigger effects uh, or trigger warnings than I could, uh, I could get into. Um, but if you feel overwhelmed during the movie, you close your eyes and take five deep breaths. Um, you're in for a real treat, you guys, and uh, it means a whole lot to me that you're here. There's a couple of trailers to get you in the mood. One, to celebrate one of the actors in the movie, Juliette Lewis. And um, I, know, I know you will think I'm kidding, but the trailer that I'm showing is truly worth watching. Uh, it is definitely an underrated and overlooked experience. And uh, the other trailers uh, along with it are to sort of parallel the experience of uh, Natural Born Killers' uh, Lovers on the Run. So you guys, thank you so much. My name is Jesse Hawthorne Biggs. This has been Next for me.